can you see my screen, Ritika? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, so this is the website. This is the uh, our ISRC website, which is called Ind Sci Cove Indian Scientists Response to COVID. So, hence insci And on the website, you will see that uh, there are, there are many links on uh, many tabs on the top. And essentially, it takes you to different uh, aspects of the website that we have been working on. There is a tab, of course, for the public, where there's a lot of information that you would like to know about based on hoaxes that are that you see on media, based on question answers that you have about COVID or daily uh, questions that you generally have about COVID, about your daily life in COVID-19 as well. And if I, if I would like, I would like to take you through a little bit of this just to uh, show you. Uh, so as I click on this for public link, you will see that there are several categories down here. And if you go to the daily life, there is mental health, hygiene, lockdown. And so if I click on the hygiene button, you will see that this pops up. And on the hygiene button, as you can see, as I'm showing you right now, there is uh, there are categories that will tell you on what to do on a daily basis and how to do it. And there are sim these mes messages have been synthesized from literature in simple language so that all of you can uh, can benefit from the work that we are doing. So the idea of ISRC is to uh, bring scientific literature to the masses in a way that is usable and palatable for everybody in our daily lives. So uh, yeah, for example, here, if you see, there is a neat section on the mask. There are stories based on how you can make, uh, in, in story format, we have described how you can make masks at home. So you can click on those and read further. We also have, ISRC also has a YouTube channel so I want to show you our YouTube channel, which is also Inside COVID, I-N-D-S-C-I, Indian Scientists, COVID, C-O-V-I-D. So Inside COVID is our YouTube channel. As, and as you can see, under this YouTube channel, we have several videos, playlists, and channels for, that, are, that we support as well. Under playlist, you will find several languages as well. Uh, besides English, there are, there are several other languages that you'll find in the playlists. Under videos, for example, you will also uh, see, uh, for example, the first one that I'm pointing to you is what is the correct way to wear a mask? And that one is a nice game that you can play online and have a way to sort of satisfy your curiosity by looking at these videos. So uh, going from there, let me uh, take you to today's session, which is essentially uh, our uh, uh, start attraction for today, which is Dr. Trivadi Ganeshan. And uh, Dr. Trivadi Ganeshan, I invite you to uh, do the seminar and I'll give a small introduction and I'll, I'll stop screen share for now so that you can get started with your screen share. In the meantime, I will introduce uh, Dr. Ganeshan. Okay. Dr. Ganeshan, you should be able to start your screen share anytime now. So in the meantime, let me go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Ganeshan. Dr. Ganeshan, uh, uh, T.S. Ganeshan, graduated from Jawaharlal Nehru Med Institute of Medical In Education and Research, Pondicherry, India, and completed his MBBS and MD in internal medicine, followed by senior residency. He completed his training in medical oncology at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, London. His doctorate on Philadelphia chromosome positive leukemias was awarded by the University of London. He was subsequently appointed as consultant medical oncologist at Churchill Hospital, Oxford, and established a laboratory as a clinical scientist and reader at the Weatherhall Institute of Molecular Medicine, Oxford. He was the first such clinical scientist in oncology in the UK. After 15 years at Oxford, he was appointed as chairman, Cancer Institute and Institute of Molecular Med Medicine at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Cochin, India, in 2006. He established the Institute of Molecular Medicine and strengthened the Cancer Institute at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. He subsequently moved to Cancer Institute Adyar in 2012 and is professor of medical oncology and head of clinical research. He has established a laboratory of cancer biology. His research interests have been on cancer genetics, stem cells, and signal transduction in addition to early clinical trials. He has also contributed to performing early phase clinical trials by gene therapy, antibodies, and vaccines, in addition to novel drugs in cancer. The research in UK was supported initially by the Imperial Cancer Research Fund and subsequently by Cancer Research UK. In India, 
The research is supported by the Department of Biotechnology and Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR. He has been awarded uh, during his tenure at, the UK, at, the, at UK, the Clinical Excellence Award. He has been a member of the Medical Research Council, UKCCR, and NICE Advisory Committees. He, in India, he has been a member of the DBT, Department of Biotechnology, DST, Department of Science and Technology, and the ICMR in advisory capacities. He has supervised over 25 doctoral students and postdoctoral fellows. He has over 175 papers to his credit in international journals. It is really my honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. Ganeshan. And Dr. Ganeshan, the platform is up to you. You can please begin the seminar today. All right, now I just switch on play, is that correct? Correct. And then I get rid of you. Uh, so if you click on the minus sign on top of the video, okay. you should be able to minimize yeah. the video. So now, can you see my face? Is that yes, we can. All right. Okay. Shall I start then? Yes, please. All right. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, for particularly to Ramanujam and other members of the Indian Scientists Collaborative to actually ask me to speak today. Uh, Ritika for helping me with the computer business and... Uh, Subhajit to introduce me. So what I'm going to do today is to give you a brief introduction about the virus, then talk about predominantly about the clinical aspects of the illness, uh, uh, which you want to. Uh... Now, the history is very important in terms of what we do. And Tyrell and Bino isolated this particular virus from a common cold in 1965. It was called B814. And subsequently next year, uh, another group isolated a similar virus, which was called 229E. But it took another 10 years before Tyrell put it together based on TEM morphology and called it the coronavirus. The reason it was called the coronavirus was because it was got spikes. Now, 15% of the common colds are due to coronavirus in the US. I don't know the figures in India because we don't routinely check for this. Now, the more difficult problem was SARS in 2003 when from China, which had uh, an epidemic in 29 countries. So this was a major problem. A lot of us had to actually um, <clears throat> um, stop doing whatever we were doing. Flights were canceled, meetings were canceled. Fortunately, it stopped after a while because of rigorous uh, containment measures. And the mortality was at the end of the day was about 10%. Now at that time, the virus was similar to Himalayan civet and it was thought to be an animal to human transmission. Even at that time, similar to what we are facing now, about 20 to 40% of wet market traders were serologically positive to SARS virus without any symptoms. Now the current virus which you are uh, having is called SARS-CoV-2 and many of you may know already, for those of you who don't know, my apologies, uh, know already, my apologies. It's closely similar to the bat coronavirus, about 96%, but about 50% of the common cold virus. And the SARS virus is about 80%. And essentially it's a 30 KB beta coronavirus, it's an RNA virus, and it's got a mutation rate of 10 to the power minus six per nucleotide per cycle, which is actually, um, you know, extra from the MHV coronavirus, the mouse virus. So this is the sort of very quick overview of the virus. And if you look at this figure, it shows you the original paper from 1967, the 2T90 strain, you can see the little virus in the TM figures with the spikes all around. And this is a more recent from the National Institute of Health. Now this is a schematic of the virus, which shows you it's about 100 nanometers in size. But the key things are these spike primers. These spike proteins are about 100 copies per virion, and they are the ones which actually attack and attach to the cells. Now you then have membrane proteins, nuclear proteins, envelope proteins, all of which are required to eventually assemble a virus. Uh, the, the, the key thing is the spike primer attaches to a receptor in the human cell, which is called the AC2 receptor. Uh, and this is present in many different cells in the body. And this AC2 receptor is the key for how the virus infects the cell. Now, very quickly and amazingly, the sequence was published only in the middle of January of this year 
And by end of February, this three-dimensional structure of the spike protein was resolved by cryo-electron microscopy. And I'm just going to play this uh, to see the three-dimensional. You can see the Y-shaped structure, which is in different colors, which is a spike protein. And essentially, this is very important to understand why you need this, because you need this to design drugs. If you attack uh, this particular receptor, then it won't wait into the cell. Uh, that is the whole idea. Now, what about Indian isolates? Now, there are 361 genomes actually being sequenced from India now, compared to a couple of months ago when I joined this group. Uh, there are about seven institutions which have contributed. And this particular analysis was done by CCMB in collaboration with IGIB. So I'm using that data. So a uh, significant proportion of the isolates A to A type were about 62%. And there was a new isotype called A3i, which formed about 62 genomes, about 29%. They had variants which made it sure that it was different from other viral strains, and it was unique to India. Uh, the nuclear capsid and envelope genes were the main changes were present. And using bioinformatic approaches, the mutation frequency was about 1.4 to 10 to the power minus 3 per year. The index case using bioinformatic approaches was actually around February of this year, but the isolate of this particular variant was from Telangana, from an Indonesian traveler. So this shows you this picture, which is from the paper, it's a preprint, which shows you in this purple color, all the different sequence variations, which make this unique. And the next variant is A2A, which has got its own changes which make it. Now, A3, B4, and B were present only in small numbers. So the majority were these two, and that is shown in this cartoon here. So you can see most of the South of India, the new variant, A3i, seems to predominate compared to the A2a, which is present more in the West of India and parts of North of India. So this is very important to know if you're trying to work out a vaccine or an, even a drug. You need to know where exactly the changes are and how closely similar are these strains. Like flu vaccines, you may have to have actually multiple vaccines which target different strains. So this is a very important observation and it's a very interesting paper. Now I told you the AC2 receptor is the key one which actually uh, 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 is important for the virus getting into the cell. This little picture, what it shows you is actually from the SARS virus. So that when the SARS virus is identified, that also goes through the AC2 wire receptor. And these are actually expression data by different techniques for different organs here, different uh, tissues. And you can see lung at the top, although it's a very common problem, it, there is not a huge amount of expression here. Although later on people showed that you can infect epithelial cells of the airways, but the gut is, expresses it very nicely. So does the kidney, so does the testis and the heart muscle. So this is why many of the symptoms we see actually relate to where this receptor is expressed. So this is a little schematic showing you the entire picture of the clinical disease. Typically, it's a, a R0 is about two to four. You get a, when you get exposed initially, there is an incubation period, a latent period, then you become really infectious, and then you become symptomatic. Once you become symptomatic, you can either recover mild, or you have a severe disease which takes about six weeks and the case fatality rate is actually quite low, similar to the infection fatality rate. This is all based from the Chinese data, although we have more data now from US and Europe, and indeed from India as well, which I'll share with you soon. Now, what are the risk factors to patients who have got this problem? So if you're old, you are in trouble. If you're very young, you are in trouble. Disease of the lung are bad news. You get asthma, emphysema, and so on. Cardiovascular disease, Diabetes mellitus, I'll show you data from India, is a very particular problem. Obesity, pre-existing kidney and liver disease, and of course, immune compromised conditions like AIDS, cancer, and tuberculosis. These are conditions which are predisposed to any infection. And one of the reasons I'm talking today, although I do not manage COVID-19, is we manage similar problems in immunocompromised patients. Exactly same problems what you see with COVID-19. But these, we, we are very good at managing infections because all our immune compromised uh, patients have infections which are very similar. Now, symptoms reflect the organ involvement where the receptor is expressed, 
Often you get fever, headache, cold, uh, which is common presenting symptoms. Uh, anosmia is a particularly important one. We lose the sense of smell. A very important uh, symptom is fatigue. Extreme tiredness and muscular ache is actually a very important symptom. As the disease progresses, you get difficulty in breathing, uh, chest pain, you can have diarrhea, you can also have vomiting. Now, less rare presentation, less common presentations are skin rash, which occurs in children more often. You can present with stroke, myocardial infarction, uh, encephalopathy. Kawasaki disease is a very rare uh, problem which presents in children. It's an acute viral sort of lymphadenitis, but many patients with COVID are presented in the same way. Now, coagulopathy is more recently recognized, and that is one of the reasons you get stroke and myocardial infarction. There is clot within the small vessels, and I'll show you data on this. And again, more recently, uh, it can attack the pancreas like many viruses which attack the pancreas. For example, type 1 diabetes mellitus is often associated with a pre-symptomatic uh, pre viral illness, usually the enteroviruses which attack the pancreas and destroy the beta cells. So similarly here, even though the patients are not diabetic, they can present with very high blood sugars, which you have to control, and it's a direct consequence of the infection. Now, if you are a doctor and you are seeing a patient, you have to make a diagnosis after examining the patients, taking the history. So the diagnosis established here by all of you are familiar with this now, an RT-PCR, which is using a fluorescent label probe, uh, effectively taking the RNA, it's an RNA virus, you have to reverse transcribe it to cDNA. And this is the gold standard, using primers to a specific, uh, but there is about a 30% false negative rate, which is very important to understand. So just because you are negative doesn't mean you are not infected always. So you will have to retest if you have got symptoms. So and now when we started this epidemic, we didn't have enough of these kits. And in fact, all over the world, people were trying to get kits from China because China had the disease first. But now in India, we have got many companies who have made this uh, kit. And so we don't have to worry about too much. And that's why tests also are being done at higher frequency uh, in patients today. But there are two other types of tests which I want to share with you. This loop-mediated isothermal amplification is an old technology. It's about 10 years old, you don't need a PCR machine. You're using very specific primers and you're actually using a, a, a sort of attribute of the RNA to actually amplify it directly using these primers, using a temperature uh, at a particular temperature. And then you can identify it by using different methods. So this has actually been developed in Trivandrum at the uh, Heart Institute and essentially the Thirthanal Institute and essentially uh, it is going to be developed by Tata and Sons. That's what I've shown here into a commercial thing. Now, CRISPR-Cas9 or Cas12 is a very interesting technology. And it's very rapid and very specific. Here, you take advantage of the fact that CRISPR-Cas9 technology, CRISPR is actually using a guide RNA. You can directly target the virus because it, it is complementary to the sequence in the virus. And then when you put Cas9 or Cas12, it identifies this region. Then you add to the mixture, the single standard probe, which is fluorescently labeled, then it cuts the single standard probe if there is actually uh, a specific sequence for the virus present, which you can then read out uh, as a lateral flow, just like a pregnancy test. So this has actually been shown to work very nicely in the US and this paper I've quoted here. But in India also, IGIB has developed similar technique using Cas9. And I'm told that Tata Sons is going to develop that commercially. So this also can give you a very specific rapid test within one hour, one or two hours, you can have the result. But to me, the most important thing is this particular uh, chap, uh, Habib Bazar, who has developed a lab on a chip. This is a small chip, which you can attach to your mobile phone. It has got in the chip, a single stranded DNA aptamer, uh, which is about the size of a coin. You just place a drop of saliva. Saliva will have your wires. And you attach, uh, the, there is a sensor in the chip. It reacts directly with the wires. And then it sends an electrical signal, which is detected by the app in your mobile. And you detect the presence of wires in 60 seconds. It's very similar to how you do your blood sugar test using a small strip and a pinprick. So it's also reusable. And there are ways of doing it. 
he had developed a prototype for Zika virus, which is the other virus, which is very problematic from Latin America. But it is being developed to look at uh, this particular disease as well. So coming back to the illness, you've got an incubation period, then you've got symptoms, and I've listed the symptoms already. Only a small minority, 5%, actually get very critically ill. But you have to worry. Once you think you might be infected uh, by contact to a person who's infected, then you have to wait for 15, 14 days before you know for sure that uh, you are unlikely to get the illness. Now, what are the symptoms? How do you manage them? So if you've got mild symptoms, controlling the fever, nutrition, vitamins, bed rest, analgesics when required uh, is, is perfectly okay majority of the time. Vitamins, particularly zinc, I think in Tamil Nadu they're using a lot and even ICMR guidelines say that. Bed rest is very important because of the hypoxemia. Now, <clears throat> analgesic is important again because of the muscular pain, headache and so on. So chloroquine and azithromycin was one of the guidelines ICMR Institute uh, introduced. And I'll go into that in some detail. But the recovery of these patients is 100%. The main problem with these patients is they can infect others. So it's effectively, they recover completely by 14 days. The majority of them have cleared the virus. A few of them will linger on till about four weeks. But by far and large, after four weeks, nobody has the virus. Now, this is the picture which you don't want to see. These are seriously ill patients. Here I'm showing you an X-ray. These white things are little patches on the lung. You can see on the CT scan better, like a sort of uh, flower here spurting around all over. And this is your typical pneumonia. It's called atypical pneumonia because we don't know the cost when you see this X-ray or scan. We'll have to do further tests. But they also can present with this large hyperdense shadow which you see in the CT scan, which is significant of hemorrhagic infarct and is actually presents like a stroke. So this sometimes can happen. So these are all more serious presentations, which I wish to share with you. Now, when you have the serious illness, the, primarily your oxygen saturation is low, particularly with the lung problem. Normally we have an oxygen saturation about 98%. Anything below 94 is a problem. So essentially what you do in this sort of thing, supportive treatment is you give oxygen by either nasal prongs or mask, it gives you about 28% inspired oxygen concentration. And then if things that cannot be controlled, you can ventilate the patient using an artificial ventilator. Some patients will require dialysis uh, because the kidneys have stopped functioning because of all these problems. Now, what drugs can you use in this uh, serious situation? Unfortunately, there are no specific drugs at the moment, although a lot of effort is being put in to try and identify. I have listed some of them. Steroids, you might have heard recently. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, we are already using methylprednisolone. It's part of the ICMR advisory as well. Similarly, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Remdesivir, I'll go into detail. Heparin also, I'll go into detail. Heparin is an anticoagulant, and that actually is very important to look at. Now, what is the evidence <clears throat> for all these drugs? Chloroquine trial. Now, chloroquine, the only large trial, which is done in the UK called the recovery trial, which I'll go to in detail, was a negative result. It's only an abstract form. There's a French trial showing it's positive, a randomized trial, small number of patients. And that was one of the reasons, along with a lot of other information that was going to be used. Now, remdesivir is actually a, a, a drug which was made for Ebola virus, and it was hanging around there without knowing what illness it should treat. It didn't work in Ebola virus very effectively. But a trial was done in the US looking at five versus 10 days, uh, with and there was no placebo here, so it is actually very important to understand uh, that this cannot be definitive. But in this five to 10 days uh, regimen, some patients actually did work uh, and they had less mortality in the ICU, less mortality on a ventilator. Dexamethasone is the last drug, which is part of the recovery trial. It was a very positive trial, only in abstract form. And since the recovery trial is actually important, I'm going to talk to you about it. It's a very important trials, a national trial. UK does these trials very well. All the hospitals are government hospitals, effectively, NHS. And so everybody gets through the same treatment. So you've got all these different drugs, lopinavir, ritinavir is used in HIV, dexamethasone. Now that they think it's working, they're only putting children on the trial. Azithromycin, I told you before. Tocilizumab, I'll come back to it. It's an IL-6 antibody 
It's supposed to help in damping down the cytokine storm when you have the lung problem. Convalescent plasma, we're also doing it. This is from patients who were infected with COVID-19, COVID-2, and they have spontaneous antibodies. Now in this trial with dexamethasone, the 28 day mortality was reduced by 17%, as opposed to the control, 41% on ventilators and 25% on O2 therapy. So their conclusion was it's effective for those on ventilation or on O2 therapy, not for mild symptoms. So that's why they took the drug off the trial because the results were very striking. Now, what do we do? This ventilation is a big thing. Initially in the course of the illness, ventilation was thought to be very important. A lot of people went on ventilators, but the mortality on ventilator because of infections is about 50%. So as far as possible, you don't want to put a patient in ventilator. That is the understanding now. There are different reasons for putting a patient on ventilator. You can have airway obstruction, you're completely tired, knackered. You have a high, very low uh, oxygen pressure. And also at the same time, you have increasing carbon dioxide pressure in the body. This combination is very important to put a patient on ventilator at any time, whatever illness you have. So encephalopathy causes confusion. And then of course, hemod hemodynamic instability. The blood pressure is not maintained. You require vasopressors, you need to go on ventilation. But there is there are problems with ventilation. It's not the panacea as people thought. Now, once you have this lung problem, I'm just mentioning this particular syndrome called cytokine release syndrome. It's actually a battle between the virus and the human host. So here, all these immune cells, monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, all react against the coronavirus. As part of this, there is a bystander effect and collateral damage by these cytokines, which damage the lung epithelium. And there is a point of no return after which you will not survive, whatever the case may be. Fortunately, similar sort of thing occurs in my own area of specialty and also in CAR T cell gene therapy. And there are drugs which actually ameliorate. Tocilizumab, which has the most experience, is actually blocks IL-6 from working. And these patients don't respond to steroids, but they respond beautifully to this tocilizumab and they get better completely. And there are other drugs, siltuximab and sertolimumab. So these drugs are being tried. And if you can get on top of the, uh, the big problem in the lung, then you will survive. There will be no problem. So this uh, particular thing, tocilizumab, is now even available in India and patients are able to take it. Now, I just want to share with you some pathology here. So this is what happens in the lung. You can see the lung is looking pretty awful. And then you've got all these inflammatory cells in the small air sacs in the lung, uh, which are all as a consequence of the infection. And here is the most important picture. It's very uh, important to show that there are thrombi, small clots in the cell, in the alveoli, as well as in the blood vessels, which are due to this coronavirus. This shows a TEM picture of the lung, and it shows you normal lung, how does it look? Normal lung, all the architecture is gone. And this is a TEM photograph showing where the virus is a small spike wires directly in the alveoli and the blood vessels. Now, if you take the kidney, this is from autopsy. See, unfortunately, we have done much autopsies in India, but this is an autopsy score from China, which shows the virus present in the tubules of the kidney, and actually it's present in the nucleus by this fluorescent. So you get direct infection. It's not indirect because of low blood pressure, your kidney is damaged. It's directly affecting the kidney. So finally, with coagulopathy and COVID-19, this is a very important problem, uh, more recently recognized, not at the beginning. This virus is actually grows and multiplies endothelial cells because the AC2 receptor is expressed in endothelial cells. Normally, these cells are difficult to isolate and show. So that's why this knowledge was not available before. And it also activates the coagulation pathway. It changes the circulatory pattern. So all this leads to clots in the blood vessels. So that's why you need the heparin. So currently in Tamil Nadu, we are using uh, oxygen therapy, prone position, no exercise, plus methylprednisolone, and we are using heparin to prevent the clotting. This seems to work. This is this cocktail, and I'm sure this cocktail will be improved in time to come. Now I'm gonna share with you, uh, this is actually data, which has been uh, published in the website of Tamil Nadu. It's only Tamil Nadu I can get easily. And with the help of Dr. Shankar, 
Dr. Morali Morgawail, and then more recently, Raja Raman. I've managed to get the data, and Raja Raman has got a very good way of getting the data. And this is still yesterday, 702 patients. You can see the majority of patients who die are in this 50 to 80 age group. Large number die. Less die when they're younger. Of course, older, there are fewer patients, so it's difficult to actually be clear cut. There are 702 patients. Now, why do they die? What are the associated comorbidities? Diabetes is present in 50% of patients. This is a very high number. And actually, uh, the common sort of incidence in the rural population is about 12%, and urban is about 20%. So here it's 50% of your patients have got diabetes or hypertension. Usually, these patients have vascular problems, their blood vessels are damaged, and that's maybe one reason the mortality is high. But importantly, uh, in about 15, 20% of patients, there is no comorbidity. They are completely healthy and they still die. Even a, today's newspaper had this. So you have to be careful just because you're young and without any comorbidities doesn't mean that you're unlikely to have a problem. So these two bubble plots, uh, this bubble plot here is actually very interesting. How long do you stay in the hospital before you uh, pass away? And this shows if you're over uh, 60 years old and you've got comorbidities, you die very quickly, very, very quickly. And if you have no comorbidities, you die less quickly, but you still die. And similarly, between 13 to 60, if you have comorbidities. So the bottom line is if you have comorbidities, you die very quickly. So this is admission to death in days and different age groups. Now, this actually is only up to 1st of June, which Raja Raman kindly made and posted in the uh, website. And I took his permission to show it to you today. And it shows you the case fatality rate overall and in younger patients. But here you see in the older patients, effectively very high case fatality rate in both men and in women compared to the others. So if you are old, you are in real trouble. So that's, that's pretty much what we all know now. Now recovery, what are the issues in recovery? Mental health issues, isolation, fear of death stigma, physical, uh, breathing issues, fatigue, it can last for two, three months. But the follow-up is very important and a lot of research has to be done here, looking at the antibody response, looking at recurrence. These two are very important issues which need to be sorted out. I hope the ICMR is actually collecting serum from these patients to know how long they have immunity and also how many people get reinfected. This will tell you, uh, unlike influenza, if you have long-lasting immunity, then you just get it once and forget about it. So recovery is an important issue and is the subject of much research. Now, in terms of drugs, if you are able to manage the acute illness effectively, then you are halfway home. So these are some of the principles here. We, we have to treat the active infection and we have got experience with other viruses. We have got drugs for HIV. We still don't have a vaccine. And we have got drugs for hepatitis. For some of them, we have a vaccine. And similarly for SARS, we still don't have a vaccine. You can repurpose drugs effective in unrelated diseases. You can screen new compounds and you can design new drugs based on the structure of the spike protein, which I showed you. So all these efforts are simultaneously taking place throughout the world. So I'm very optimistic that we will find something. And this is actually a schematic showing various targets uh, for this is actually the IL-6 target. This actually inhibits this little protease, which is very important and prevents viral entry. This actually prevents the interaction, this chloroquine here, then the HIV drugs, which are protease inhibitors, and this are nucleus inhibitors. They inhibit the ribonucleus. So you cannot make the uh, RNA. So if you cannot make the RNA, you cannot make the virus. So repurposing drugs, we have got plenty, chloroquine. Uh, I told you the HIV drugs, ribavirin, oseltamivir is often used for cold, influenza, the nominofer, it's actually not much data is available. People are looking at it. Interferon, that's what we produce in our body against any viral infection. And that's actually very important to know. And there are many trials looking at this, including the solidarity trial. Ivermectin is actually a deworming agent, but there is good data on that. More recently, uh, a drug which is used in chronic lymphatic leukemia actually seems to work very well. It's a B cell inhibitor and B cells are active in this condition. And this particular small molecule seems to work very well in a small number of patients and more trials need to be done. Now, remdesivir, I've already talked about. A is now 
going to be made in India is available, it's expensive. Tocilizumab, I told you, and serilizumab also, I told you. Now, neutralizing antibodies are important. You can make antibodies against the virus and you can use them like drugs. And this is also an approach which is being undertaken by different groups. Fusion proteins, there's already data published showing that if you make a fusion protein with the AC2 receptor, uh, which will competitively inhibit the virus binding AC2 receptor, then you can block entry of the virus into the cell. Now, this is the approach people use for treating rheumatoid arthritis, for example, uh, with the TNF alpha receptor. So this sort of approach can be used. Plasma therapy, we've already discussed. Now, finally, I come to vaccine, uh, last few slides. Uh, this is actually very important. It has to be safe. It has to be immunogenic. It has to last long. It has to be effective against all age groups. And you have to be able to manufacture at large scale equitable. Now, India manufactures 75% of all the vaccines in the world. So we've got a lot of experience, mainly companies. Now, this particular vaccine made by the Germans was very efficacious during the Ebola. Ebola, as some of you may know, is a very horrible virus. It's very dangerous and it's got a very high fatality rate, uh, over 50%. Uh, very few people survived that. But this uh, vaccine actually gave uh, some efficacy during the epidemic. This is the Oxford group, chimpanzee adenovirus, which also gave very similar results. Now you can have different types of vaccine. You can look at the whole virus. You can look at the protein subunit. You can look at just the nucleic acid or you can make parts of the virus, put it in another virus, which is very, uh, what do you call, it, immunologically active, like adenovirus, pox virus, or the simple common cold virus. So these are all things which you can approach. And I'll show you in the next slide. People have already got experience with all these approaches. These are all the licensed vaccines which are available, including Japanese encephalitis, which is a common problem in India, where you have these type of approaches worked out. Now, Currently, institutions throughout the world are developing viruses, uh, vaccines against SARS-CoV-2, and these are the different companies involved. Uh, so this is just a small number. There are about 100 different uh, academic groups and companies involved. Now, we are already in clinical trial mode, and I'm just going to give you a glimpse of what are the clinical trials for which data is available. The mRNA trial using mRNA-1273, which is an RNA-based vaccine from Moderna and BioNTech from Germany. These two are already in phase two. Similarly, DNA-based vaccines, these are all simple to make. So that's why they're very quick off the uh, mark. Uh, you got this from uh, Innovopharmia, then Simrivo is another spike protein-based vaccine. The viral vectored vaccine, which there is a lot of hope. One is from China with adenovirus. The other one is from chimpanzee adenovirus, which is from the Jenner Center at Oxford. They all through phase one, phase two trials. What is the story in India? In India, we have got Serum Institute making in collaboration with Oxford, the adenovirus, chimpanzee adenovirus vaccine, which they're going to make in large amounts. Bharat Biotech is making de novo vaccine from an Indian isolate, from NIV, which is very similar to the original Wuhan virus. Minvax in Bangalore is making a protein-based virus. Kerala is making a DNA vaccine an Indian immunological is working in Australia with Australia for another approach. Now, the BCG vaccine is very interesting. Uh, one of the reasons we all do well in India compared to the rest of the world, our mortality rate is half or maybe even less compared to other parts of the world, is partly because of this immunity afforded to BCG, which we all take, but many countries don't. So this is being looked at again by ACMR in a very big way, and that's uh, going to be off. Uh, the short, very, uh, you know, very soon. So, so I'm going to come to the last side and summarize here. I think I've got my half an hour. So prevention is the main sort of uh, approach. Uh, you have to have these simple measures, but vaccination is the long-term strategy. Whether we will be successful is very, uh, very difficult to predict because it takes about a year and then you have to have an effective vaccine. So, but unfortunately, fortunately, it's only 20% of patients who are symptomatic and about 95% of them will get better without any problem with appropriate treatment. Is this 5%, which is a problem and I mentioned all the approaches. If you can get on top of these 5%, then we don't have to worry too much about this illness. Like many other illness, 
like typhoid fever, for example, we can get on top of it. Participation in research trials are very important. And slowly India is participating in the solidarity trial, in this vaccine trial, and many other trials which are ongoing. In Recovery is the norm for the majority uh, of patients. So you should not worry too much. With that, I conclude, stay safe and be prepared for the long haul. And thanks to the ICRC for giving me the opportunity to share with you. Thank you, Dr. Ganeshan, for, for the wonderful informative talk. And I must say, very, very updated talk because you all, all updated many of your data slides until yesterday. That's amazing. So uh, rarely we get to hear such updated data. And so I, I, there are a bunch of questions in the chat window. Uh, so what sure. I'll do is I'll try to uh, sort of ask, merge some of the questions that I think are kind of together. So maybe I can start by asking, uh, Sandhya asks uh, that there are different outcomes in comorbidities that are that are managed well before the infection. So do you have any comments on that as to how that might uh, correlate? This means geographically in India? Uh, no, about the com comorbidities that are uh, managed differently uh, based on the type of comorbidity that you have. Well, I see the problem is many of the patients come late. If you come early, then managing diabetes is not a problem. Managing hypertension is not a problem. You will be able to get on top of it very well with insulin and you should be able to control it very effectively. But uh, when people come late, that's when the problem starts. Another, another sort of related, not uh, comorbidity really, but another related question is that, uh, what, are, what about immunocompromised patients like HIV positive people? Are they more at risk or are, are dying yeah, or getting yeah, the infection? Well, the, well, HIV, the data is not so much available. HIV patients who are on proper treatment should not be more at risk. If their CD4 count is high and normal, then they should not be more at risk. But certainly cancer patients are more at risk. There is enough data now showing that if you have cancer, your mortality is high, your morbidity is high, and our own experience shows that they do get infected much more easily. Hmm. Um the, the, there is a question uh, from Ritika as to what is the reason for high mortality of patients and ventilators that you pointed out? Okay, ventilator, see, there are several things which an ordinary person has to understand. When you go on a ventilator, you have to be put to sleep, light water. You have to be put to sleep, light water. You have to be put to sleep. Uh, so that means you're unconscious, effectively. You're sedated. And secondly, uh, when you put a tube down, you have to aspirate regularly to make sure secretions don't stay behind because you cannot cough it out. So in a patient who is COVID-19 positive, however careful you are, the staff will not be uh, so um, meticulous as with the patient who doesn't have COVID-19 because they have also got fear of infection. So how effectively you aspirate is very important. Thirdly, because of this tube being persistently there, more than seven days, you have to do a tracheostomy. You get infection. You get what is called ventilator-acquired pneumonia. And it is because of the infection you die, actually. And then lungs, of course, because of constant ventilation with high oxygen pressure, become stiff and they become fibros. So they don't respond to your oxygenation anymore. So there are a whole series of things which happen. And then you don't recover from this. So the, the mortality throughout the world, if you're on ventilator, even the best hospitals is actually quite high. It's about 40 to 50%. So you should not go on a ventilator as much as possible. So the only way you can avoid it is to reach the hospital as quickly as possible once you've got symptoms. So um, Kirtan Kumar uh, asks this question as to how do we find if a patient is asymptomatic and if he could spread the virus? And there are a couple of other questions that are asymptomatic patient related. So uh, there is a question that say asks that are there studies that show that asymptomatic patients have uh, that are that have less lesser provoked immune responses as compared to symptomatic and therefore have less IL six. So are there any treatment options for asymptomatic? Though I don't know if that is important that much. But question then would be that what other problems can asymptomatic people have in future if you are saying that the virus is going to uh, come uh, reside in other tissues as well. Well, asymptomatic patients, I think, see, the maximum they can secrete the virus for about 9 to 14 days, actually. By about 9 days, you clear the virus, majority of patients. So they're not going to infect forever. The rare patient can, but the majority won't. 
there are no symptoms. So what are you going to treat? You don't have to treat right. them. You don't even know that they have got the disease. So unless you, in a family where one person actually gets a disease and you screen the other members, and some of them don't have any symptoms, but they have got positive for the virus, those patients, you have to monitor very carefully. That's all you can do. At the moment, you don't have any treatment. Uh, but of course, uh, Tamil Nadu, for example, and there are other parts of India, they're trying all the Indian medicines. The Chinese are trying Chinese medicines. But essentially, there is no drug which will prevent the virus from replicating at the moment. I think the fear uh, is in part with the idea that uh, you that you have said that the virus is able to go because of the ACE2 receptor expression all of, in various other tissues, the virus can reside in these other tissues. So uh, as, as for asymptomatic patients, do we have to worry about that aspect, first of all? And secondly, there's a related question is that even, uh, even after a symptomatic person uh, gets cured, how long or how how long does the virus still reside in the body thereafter? No, no, the virus gets uh, you can get rid of the virus within 14 days, even if you have the illness. The majority of the patients, the virus is out. That's why we got the two week window. So the virus doesn't hang around forever. The virus causes the damage, and it's a damage which actually takes you prolonged stay in the hospital for four to six weeks. So the virus is out of the picture by about uh, two weeks, really. The majority of the patients, it doesn't hang around very long. It's actually a hit and run. So in that in that case, a related question that in the, the smell, I guess the loss of smell will also not last for long or will it? No, smell is actually in the very early phase of the illness before you even have fever. That's why it was spotted by a lot of people before you even have fever. It's because it goes through the nose and you know the olfactory nerve goes directly to the frontal lobe. And the theory is that it goes through the olfactory nerve, directly goes to the and affects the sense of smell in the uh, frontal lobe. And so that's why you get the anosmia. Hmm. So, but unless you do autopsies, we don't know. Yeah. I think, uh, so there's, there are a couple of questions on treatment related options as well. So uh, Ramanujan asks that for an inpatient uh, 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 person, what clinical tests are used to determine whether the patient's illness is turning serious or not? Uh, <laughs> Well, the simplest way you can do, see, majority of our patients, other than routine biochemical tests, you have to make sure the blood count is okay, the kidney function is okay, the liver function is okay. But the lung seems to be the major problem in the majority of patients. Those patients without any comorbidities, I showed in the chart, almost all of them have died because of the lung problem. Hmm. They have no other illness. So you can measure the oxygen pressure by using a pulse oximeter. So if you have a pulse oximeter, it costs about 1,000 rupees. You just put it on your finger. It'll tell you what's your pressure, is PO2. So you can, if it is about 94%, you can be relaxed. Mm -hmm. So once it drops below 94%, you have to get to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So that means your lungs are getting in trouble. So, are so you that's are the you simplest way. Even in the hospital, you can do this. Mm -hmm. So are you suggesting that people can do this at home for people who are potentially yes, asymptomatic? Can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you uh, can. It's like taking a thermometer temperature, yeah. uh, checking your temperature with thermometer. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, there is a question on uh, on what is the role of alpha defensin in blood clotting? Right. Um, what is the role of alpha defensin in blood clotting? Well, I must pass that question. I don't know whether alpha defensin, I don't know. I'm afraid okay. I don't know. Colchicin uh, has also has been proposed by Hadassah researchers as an approved drug used in prevention of gout uh, uh, or uh, uric acid. So is colchicin going to be also be effective in... Uh, Not as far as I know. In all the repurposed drugs, I mean, I have given all the references. Mm -hmm. People can look at it. Uh, colchicin doesn't figure as a drug. Colchicin okay. is very toxic, you know. Mm -hmm. It's used in the laboratory to uh, stop uh, chromosomes from dividing the metaphase mm -hmm. bread. That's the only reason we use colchicine. So we don't use it as a drug for any condition. So it's a very toxic drug. There are a couple of questions on uh, on effectiveness of, what, what is the effectiveness of uh, favipravir? Or say IL-6 inhibitors, anything, that, any data that is known on, about yeah. IL-6? Favipravir, somebody asked in the uh, Indian science thing yesterday. I replied to that. Uh, essentially, there is only uh, Chinese data, small randomized trial. Japanese also have got data showing there is some improvement with febrile compared to no febrile, along with other drugs, steroids and stuff like that. 
So uh, at the moment, that's all we have. Uh, but I am hopeful that there will be there are trials being conducted elsewhere in the world and also in India. Mm. So we should have some data. I mean, Glenmark is making the drug. Uh, it's actually quite expensive. It's not very cheap. Uh, so, uh, but nevertheless, uh, we should have some data from India. Uh, there's a question on palm strategy. So, what is the protocol? Palm, P A L M, palm, palm strategy. So, uh, that you referred to. So, what is the protocol that is used in palm strategy? As are there uh, inclusion, exclusion criteria? No, no, nothing. See, uh, the, in Tamil Nadu, it's fairly straightforward. Any patient with COVID 19 who's admitted, uh, they have regular discussions uh, amongst the physicians in all the hospitals. Uh, they have regular discussions and they keep updating their knowledge based on the experience they have on the ground. They're all very busy. Uh, so that's why you've not had any publications from India. In fact, none. I searched yesterday. There's not a one publication showing the clinical experience of any physician from India, actually. Wow. Whereas you have from China, you have from US, from Europe and so on. So the palm actually is developed. Initially it was called LAMP, now it is called palm. Palm is basically prone position. If you have the prone position, your oxygenation is better to the back of the lung. Mm -hmm. and then if you avoid exercise, so when you're hypoxemic, you should not exercise, you should be at bed rest. So that's very important. Then methylprednisolone they're using instead of dexamethasone. Mm -hmm. They're anti-inflammatory drugs and it damps down the infection. They're using at a modest dose. It's not very toxic at that dose, except when you have diabetes. When you have diabetes, then your blood sugar will go up with the methylprednisolone. So you have to use more insulin to control the sugar. So it becomes a tricky business. Then the last one is heparin. Uh, you can use different types of heparin, which are anticoagulants, which prevent the clotting. So here you are trying to reduce the inflammation, reduce the clotting, and allow the lungs to uh, recover by giving them time, by reducing the amount of energy which you need to expend. So that's all there is to it. It's not a very complicated protocol, uh, but it's a best buy at the moment. Uh, I, unless we have new drugs uh, like remdesivir or fevipiravir or any one of the new compounds which are being uh, trialed at the moment. Hmm. So I'm, I'm going to move on to uh, a set of uh, questions that are coming on mortality and immunity. So uh, is it clear that uh, the mortality rate in India is less than the rest of the world where BCG is not used? Oh, well, is that still holds true? Well, assuming the mortality data is properly documented in India, I'm assuming that is correct. Even in Tamil Nadu, there is a problem. You know, That is not intentional. That is just two departments not speaking together at the same time. Now, Maharashtra has suddenly put in 2,000 patients into the... Thing. Right. So, but overall, our mortality is less than 5%, about 5% nationally. And different states have different, like Tamil Nadu has got very low, so is Kerala, and so on. So, is there is, is no that... clear cut reason why the mortality oh. is low compared to the rest? So, the hypothesis are one is the BCG vaccine. Number two, uh, the hypothesis is that since we are a hot tropical country, a lot very crowded hugely populated. We're exposed to many infections, including coronavirus infections when we are young. So there is some cross immunity. That is the other reason. Finally, genetics. Uh, we don't know the genetics of the Indian host, uh, how they interact with the virus. So all this will come out in research. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's a question on uh, related to see the immunity, the antibodies uh, that we are producing. So have antibodies been found that provide protective immunity to recovered patient recovery for recovery and if yeah, if so uh, does this immunity depend de vary depending on the strain of the viruses that you have shown no i think uh, see at the moment see no i'll give you the ideal scenario you got covid-19 as a patient you're recovered from the disease so your blood really should have enough antibodies mm -hmm. igg antibodies and igm the initial phase now you can take the serum of that patient, test in your lab to see how effective that antibody is in preventing cytopathic effect from the virus. You can score that by titering. So effectively, if you do that, there will be two groups of patients. Some patients who have got very good antibody reactions, some group of patients who have got less effective. 
So uh, that is all we know at the moment. There is no strained relationship at the moment which we can you know, foresee because this type of research, we need very good antibody testing program. Uh, the main problem nationally, internationally is the antibody test, the kits which are available, including the Abbott one, uh, they're not 100% reliable. That is part of the problem. Although India has now got some kits, so we will see how they, they've done a major screen in India, about 0.7% of the population are actually, have got antibodies, even without any knowledge of prior infection. Hmm. Uh, uh, is there sort of a related uh, an anecdotal evidence that uh, plasma from say southern region where the strain seemed slightly different is effective in a northern region where the strain was slightly I, different? I, I don't have any data to support that observation. Absolutely okay. not. Okay. Um, so th th there are a couple of questions on uh, on s how long does how long is a person's in a person infectious after the symptoms disappear? Traditionally, I think two weeks. Overall, two weeks is the disease length. Okay. So you, if you are uh, symptomatic, it depends on what symptoms you have. If you are seriously ill, uh, your your virus might disappear even before your symptoms disappear. Hmm. If you're and, uh, mildly ill, then uh, by about day nine, all the virus is gone. Hmm. So I think a related question is that uh, if the, can the virus be, as you said before, that the virus is most likely not hiding, but question is that why before you're recovering, can it make a comeback again within the same patient? If, can, if the virus isn't hiding in some other tissues where it has not well, completely been eradicated from? I don't think we have any evidence to support that observation, but both in China and Taiwan and Korea, They've had the odd patient coming back two months later with the virus. Even in Tamil Nadu, a nurse actually tested, that was reported in the papers, just tested, she was negative, and then she came back to work, and then she again tested positive, and she died eventually. So um, I suspect in this scenario, this particular nurse and the Taiwanese and the Korean, either it's a second infection, if it is coming a month or two later, but if it is within that two week period, then you have not got rid of it. You're that rare person, who's going to take much longer, two, four weeks before you get rid of the virus. So if you're not getting rid of the virus, it is still doing some harm to your body, then you're in trouble. Yeah. So th there's no evidence that these are different strains that are reinfecting no, no. this? Not at the moment, no. Okay. And the symptoms also don't differ from strain to strain? They're no. all... At the moment, no. Okay. Um... I think the Indian study, unfortunately, is, is a you know bioinformatic come sequencing study. They have not correlated with the clinical symptomatology. So it would have been okay. fascinating if they go back and look at that A3I patient, see yeah. how they actually differed from the A2 clot. Right. So right. Bombay, Maharashtra had A2 predominantly. Now South India had predominantly A3I. Tamil Nadu was predominantly A3I. Hmm. So that may be there, but we don't have any evidence to support. Hmm. I think uh, going to a morbid question from here is that once the person dies of COVID, uh, is it so? Is the myth the, there's a myth that the spread of virus happens through the dead body? Is it true? No, no. See, uh, basically, I think current guidelines are very clear. ICMR and uh, individual state guidelines, how to cremate or bury a dead body. They are usually covered. They're disinfected and everything. And the people who transport the body, they also wear personal protective equipment. Once the body is buried or cremated, cremated, you are doing at 1,500 degrees. There is no way the virus can survive. Correct. And the burial also, you are covering it in a six foot deep grave. So it's unlikely to be of any uh, worry to anybody actually. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, the, the key thing is when the patient dies, uh, whatever secretions which come out after the patient dies, through the nose, through the ear, through the mouth and so on, they will all be infected. Most of the time, they'll be infected. So you well, have to make sure that, that you are not in contact with them mm. as a relative. Mm. Uh, but the staff who are around the patient know about all this. So mm. they take extraordinary care to make sure that this is So uh, a couple of statements that you made has sparked a few questions. So I'm going to take, take this last set of questions and then wind up because we don't have too much time. But essentially, what are the difficulties in doing randomized, randomized controlled trials uh, in teaching hospitals in India. And uh, the a related question is, why is there such a lack of uh, clinical study papers from India? Why aren't we doing this? Tough question to answer. I am a doctor and an academic. See, the reason is several fold. One is our um, 
faculty the strength actually is very low. So if you compare, for example, I'll give you an example. Dana Faber in Boston, in the medical oncology department has got 60 medical oncologists, all right? Now I, working in Cancer Institute, in our department, we have got seven medical oncologists. So this is very simple. It's just a question of numbers. So if you've got a lot of doctors, they're all academics in big institutions, then they can have spare time to actually do research. So that is number one problem. Okay, so that is a manpower issue. Still, you can do research. You have to actually guide other people who have got more free time. Now that requires that you are very good at doing research. Unfortunately, most of the doctors who are trained today are not trained in doing clinical research. It's an act, um, additional skill they have to acquire after they, become, after they finish the training as a postgraduate. So these are the two major issues. Third is infrastructure to do research. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you are a lab scientist, I am a lab scientist as mm -hmm. well. You need people to do the research. So if you don't have the infrastructure, you cannot do, a single person cannot do search. Yeah. So uh, these are all issues. ICMR is trying to tackle all this and improve the research infrastructure. They've, they've given five crores to everybody in government colleges. It's not a small amount of money. Uh, the problem is the manpower issue, I think, and also the inability uh, to understand how research is done. So the, the papers, in fact, uh, you are talking about the Tamil Nadu experience with this lamp and palm. They should have published it by now. Mm -hmm. They would have treated enough number of patients to get a feel for what it's like. Now, without going through the case notes, I have no way of knowing whether it is working or not. That is the problem. I think we have cover, covered a huge breadth of information going from all the way from remedies to I mean, potential uh, remedies to what we can do in Indian academia to bridge this gap between what is happening in the hospitals to what the communication gap that we are facing currently in India. Uh, with that, I would like to kind of conclude this session and uh, thank uh, Dr. Ganeshan again for really gracing this uh, occasion and really helping us understand in depth as to what, how, what are the, what are the various layers that one has to, that a doctor has to go through when treating COVID-19 and why there is still, what, what we are still doing about finding out new cures and new treatment strategies towards this infection. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Ganeshan. And uh, I would like to uh, remind our viewers uh, who have logged in today for the first time that uh, there is, that we, I have, I, I'll, I'll, I'll paste in a, a bunch of, I've pasted a bunch of uh, links in the in the chat session as well, if you scroll up. And essentially these are, uh, we have a YouTube channel, which is Inside COVID, I-N-D-S-C-I-C-O-V-I-D. Inside COVID is our YouTube channel where you can go and log in and there are all of our ISRC, previous IRC webinar talks are there on, on, the, on that uh, platform. You'll find talks about uh, from Anna Bhattacharya about making your mask from historians of science from uh, Gagandeep Kang on vaccines. So uh, there are several other talks that are quite interesting and including this one, which will also be put up. So please spread the word. Uh, people who want to know about uh, bona fide updated information through our uh, channel, please do spread the news. With that, I thank uh, Dr. Ganeshan again, and thank you for everybody for joining us today in this seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I sign off? Yes, please. Thank you.